out the poll at the end of the session. Uh, your feedback is very critical for us to make sure that these sessions are, um, are valuable and um, relevant for what you're experiencing on the ground. With that uh, being said, um, these sessions are being recorded. Um, so that way you can reference um, the recordings at your own um, later on if you need to. So um, I just want to quickly check, Erin, have we started recording? Perfect. Okay, good. Thank you. My colleague is having a little bit of an internet issue this morning. Uh, and so she's asked if I could run through some of the slides. So I'm happy to step in and do that. Um, as you know, we are using the ECHO model of, um, of uh, training for this, uh, for these sessions. And so there are some etiquette, some um, things to keep in mind when you engage in today's session. The foundation of love and respect um, is what we employ. Um, so respond kindly rather than react if you disagree. It's everybody's responsibility to keep ECHO a safe space. So your, your comments, your concerns, your experiences are valid. And so we want you to know uh, to uh, share those. We respect it. And uh, we hope you will respect other people's comments and experiences as well. Please test your equipment ahead of time. Mute your microphone when you're not speaking. That mute button should be at the bottom left corner of your screen. Remember to unmute before speaking, otherwise no one can hear you. And make sure to introduce yourself before you speak. Please let us know your name and um, where you're calling in from and what institution you're a part of. That way we know um, who you are. Speak clearly and stay close to your microphone. If you have any IT related issues, please send a message through the chat feature on Zoom. Um, or you can email us at assisthtm at assistinternational.org. Um, this way, if you drop off the call or you're unable to share a comment or a thought, you can either type it in. Um, if not, you can just email us and we'll make sure to, that you have access to the record, today's recording for reference. Here's just a quick agenda for today. We'll try to spend about 30 minutes or so um, with some didactic components around oxygen concentrators. Uh, for those of you who have been joining on a weekly basis, you may recall we already did a session on oxygen concentrators a few weeks ago. Today's session is going to be very interesting because there were several questions asked last time that we're going to address on today's session. And we have some pretty exciting practical content for you to look at today. We also have some case study presentations from our friends in Ethiopia. And so we're excited about that and we'll have some time for discussions at the end. With that being said, um, just a quick reminder because of the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we're all facing, um, we thought it would be important to highlight this um, on a weekly basis. The coronavirus is stable for long periods of time on surfaces. And so um, they say in aerosols for up to three hours, on copper for up to four hours, uh, on cardboard for up to 24 hours, on plastic and stainless steel surfaces for up to three days. Uh, and these are based on tests that were done in labs. Uh, the CDC was a part of it. And so because this virus can last for a long time, it, is, um, it, it increases the uh, rate of transmission. So, um, how do we keep our hospitals, equipment, and ourselves virus-free? Well, one thing to consider is personal protective equipment. Use gloves, disposable or washable gowns. Use your hats, shoe covers, N95 respirators, um, eye goggles, or face shields when you're working on equipment or in clinical care environment. Be sure to use disinfectants um, that are known to be effective against viruses. Um, and so we've given you um, some links that you can reference, some of the chemicals that would be good to have in your disinfectant. Now, while um, PPE is extremely important, please note that gloves and PPEs do not replace hand hygiene. You have to observe proper hand hygiene pro uh, practices before and after the use of PPEs. 
In summary, everyone should practice basic hygiene and social distancing. In hospital settings, clinicians and biomedical professionals should adopt the following in addition to standard procedures. Increased frequency of basic hygiene like hand washing, increased use of personal protective equipment uh, to protect against droplet and airborne infections. Such, um, and so you could use respirators and face masks against uh, airborne and droplet uh, infections. Uh, uh, infections. Increased frequency of equipment disinfection. The virus can last up to three days on some surfaces, so please be sure to use proper disinfectants as recommended by CDC or WHO, uh, and autoclave materials at high enough temperatures for long, uh, for long enough time. Um, and if you need some more information on um, the whole hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, our first session was built around that. Um, we are revamping that module again for uh, with some more additional information, but you can reference our session one for that information. With that being said, I'm going to hand over to Guna for the didactic uh, portion of today's presentation. Um, and please, in the meantime, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat and we'll get to it at the end of today's session. Guna, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk about oxygen concentrator, like what Benjin said earlier, we did spoke about oxygen concentrator, but this time we're going to uh, dig much more deeper on details. So uh, everyone know how oxygen concentrator work as a biomed. Um, normal air contain of 80% nitrogen and 21% oxygen or 20% oxygen that uh, push into the motor compress and go through the heat exchange and go to the search tank and uh, end up in the Soviet uh, tank or zeolite tank, uh, absorb the nitrogen and release the oxygen from the Soviet tank and go to the product tank. So the product tank is uh, mainly uh, to make sure that uh, get the stability of the uh, flow of the oxygen because Soviet tank will keep on doing the switching. So during that period of time, uh, you, you may be loss of pressure. So the product tank intend to keep the pressure in the same level. So there's no loss of pressure. So from there, it go to the pressure reg regulator and flow, flow meter adjustment valve. Then you get a pure oxygen of 90 to 95. So that's how it works on oxygen concentrator. And a type of uh, accessories that you're normally going to see is a cannula type that uh, you have to remember you can use the range of uh, on the low flow application, zero to 15 liter, uh, liter per minute supply. And always remember there's a different size for adult unit, all that. And very important, it's a single use. And during COVID, it's, all, it's always a single use. And during COVID also, it should be single use because uh, transmitting uh, infection will be much more higher if you wrongly use for another person. But remember, these are single use accessories. Pricing observation. So it's almost a similar thing. I'm, I'm going to repeat on certain um, things that you need to know. Uh, on oxygen concentrator, the material that you use is a molecule severe. Some people call zeolite that absorb nitrogen from the air and release uh, oxygen. So the amount of nitrogen that molecule severe can absorb depends on the pressure that you give on the cylinder itself. So if the the, the greater the pressure, you're going to get uh, a better oxygen output. But at the same time, the zeolite itself got a limitation of percentage of uh, oxygen that can release. Depends on the type of zeolite that you're going to get in the Soviet tank. So more pressure, more nitrogen is been absorbed, and eventually you're got, going to get a release of oxygen. So air consists about 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Everyone knows that. And uh, most of the pressure swing observation circuit 
you're going to see two feet uh, valve that allowed air to enter the Soviet tank, the two Soviet tank that they have, and two ways to release the um, nit unwanted gas nitrogen out up to the atmosphere. And one equalizer to allow the gas flow on the Soviet bed, uh, pushing each other. So that's how it works. So you can see how it works. When the first one is absorbing, then the other one will be releasing. At the same time, you can see the valve. So uh, the valve is changing and releasing the nitrogen out and restart to nitrogen and uh, all type of other gases that F are released. And you IO2 concentration through these particular two zeolites. So that's how it works. So it will, will be switching the particular pressure for each tank to get the oxygen. So all the switching is done on the valve. So that's how it works. So some design you're going to see only two valves that work, but is work as a, each valve work, work as a double valve. So one is uh, sending out pressure, another one is releasing. So it works such a way. So block diagram, again, you're going to get room air going into the uh, system and uh, going through a filter. From the filter to the compressor. From the compressor, you're going to get, go to the heat exchange. And valve assembly that going to switch that particular line uh, to zeolite 1 and zeolite 2. And uh, you got exhaust muffler. What happens is when the uh, when the switching is happen, one of the zeolite going to release the unwanted gas out again. So during the switching, you're going to get equalizer check valve going to change and uh, send to the product tank. So the equalizer and the valve going to send to the product tank, make sure that particular flow is stable on the product tank and you'll go through the pressure regulator and the product filter and to the output with the flow meter. So remember product filter need to replace every 10,000 hours. And remember that every single oxygen concentrator that you're going to see, that's a hour meter that will indicate how many hours you've been using that particular oxygen concentrator. So always make sure that you clean inside to prevent dust, all that build up. So when, when you got so much of dust inside the, inside the oxygen concentrator, your fan is not going to work properly, all that. And eventually what happens is you're going to create heat inside. And remember that in oxygen concentrator, there's two thermal switch always there. One is for the inside the system. Another one is inside the compressor. So what happens is when your fan don't work properly and your filter is not uh, full with dust, all that, you don't get a proper room air going in, all this, it's going to create heat inside and eventually either the room thermal switch going to switch off, going to trigger, or the compressor thermal switch can trigger, eventually it fails. So, Make sure you keep clean and make sure the filters are working properly and replace the filter when during the service, all that. So we did talk about earlier about filters. So air intake filters, there's few types. One is um, a washing type and reuse again. You can wash and reuse it back. And uh, some are single use, that uh, work for 15 hours, 15,000 hours, then eventually you have to replace. You cannot clean them. Some, you can clean them. And it uh, depends on the condition and uh, manufacturer recommendation, you have to replace accordingly. Yeah, it worked more than 50 hours, uh, 15,000 hours, but what happens is sometimes you ended up 
maybe 10,000 hours because that area maybe dust or something like that. So eventually, your filter need to be replaced. And product filter, you have to replace every 10,000 hours. And please refer to your hour counter on the oxygen concentrator that you need to check what's the hours. Like if you see 10,000 hours, that means you have to change the product filter. 15,000 hours, you check if they got an EPA filter that need, need to be replaced, just change the EPA filter as well. So these are very important actually. So if your filter is good, all that, your performance of your oxygen concentrator will be there. Because like, if you're talking about product filter, if your filter is not being maintained and you've been using that particular filter, it ended up, it collect dust all that and create high pressure, all this. Even the sing, uh, air intake filter can cause a compressor full with dust all that because what happens is uh, the heat create on the compressor all that can cause the particular air intake filter become a soft and the compressor and uh, eventually you get a compressor heating up and high pressure compressor all that so important components everyone knows there's a equalizer valve on top that's a low pressure part of it and you got a control board and power supply so the control board to control all the valve movement and the bottom one is high pressure circuit with your attached to your compressor near to the compressor so you get two feet valve feeding the air into the Soviet tank and two waste valve that feed out as send out the waste of uh, unwanted gas out from the particular thing. Some unit use only two valve and work with the feed and uh, waste are built like a two way switch valve. So sometimes you ended up going to see equalizer valve and at the bottom only two valve. So it depends on the manufacturer actually. So now we're going to talk about serviette belt. So serviette belt work like a filter that uh, inside oxygen concentrator that separate nitrogen and oxygen in the air thing. So basic, uh, basic thing is like, you give a pressure of uh, air into the serviette tank, it's going to absorb the nitrogen and release the oxygen on the top of the system. So, all the typical oxygen concentrator you're going to see two serviette weight. So that's uh, very common. And uh, if very important, two serviette weight have to be in good condition to get equal output. Sometimes you get one serviette weight broken. Eventually, the other one uh, is good, but you still get, uh, you don't get a good reading because. Uh, it doesn't perform very well. So you have to look into that part as well. So common problem, say we have um, the zero light always um, have lifespan. For zero light, uh, Soviet tank, it can last up to 20,000 hours. Some, if you maintain very well, work up to 40,000 hours. So depends how you maintain, you keep it clean, and I uh, always make sure that uh, you check on the hour counter as a reference. Is it 20, 20 hours, 40 hours, all that? So if severe tank intend to lose the filter property on long, long run, if more than 20 hours or 40 hours, but at the same time, the place is very high humid, all that, the lifespan will reduce actually. Because what happens is when the air intake go, go in, the humid is very high, it's ended up into the Soviet tank. When you pressure up, you're going to send to the Soviet tank. Eventually, the lifespan reduced because of that. So water, area with water, all that, you need to be careful because um, 
oxygen concentrator, um, what happens is it intends to absorb this humid into the system, and the Soviet uh, tank is doesn't perform very well during that particular uh, period of time, and life span can reduce. So always make sure that area is dry and clean all that. So sometimes what happens is you got one Soviet tank is not performing, another one is working. You cannot replace one, but you need to replace both actually. So you need to check that particular part of it. So the Soviet tank, if uh, the humid is very high, it's been absorbed by water, all that, the weight of the Soviet tank changed as well. So it ended up become very hard and the pressure on the system will be higher. So that's the reason when you see on the high pressure section, your reading will be very high and you get high pressure alarm, all this because of this. And uh, zeolite price normally for one kilo is about $8 USD. And they got a code name of 13XHP. That's a normal zeolite that you use for zero to five liter um, liter per minute uh, oxygen concentrator, and you can use up to eight lit liter per minute uh, type. And uh, the other one is US USD thirty four dollars per kilo lithium base, and uh, these are not included shipping. The lithium base um, type, the lifespan is much more longer, so that's the reason it's a bit expensive. So when you do severe bed reforms, replacement, always uh, you need to replace all the gasket and filter. Replace the 8 cm O-ring during the process. Um, I'll explain what the 8, 8 cm O-ring later. The product filter, bacteria filter should be replaced every 10,000 hours of use. And the canister, are refilled with new, new zeolite material. And uh, make sure you clean the canister, remove the label, all that, and you can uh, put the date of replacement. And you need to do pressure tests at 45 PSI, then monitor in use on the concentrator to ensure the leak and high oxygen purity. So you need to monitor by using your oxygen concentrator. And remember when there's a leak, the oxygen concentrator may not uh, affect it immediately, but uh, later on, they, they're going to get a few unwanted issues. So make, make sure there's no leak when you do the 45 PSI test, all that. So make sure the leak test is important when you complete uh, assembling the zeolite. So these are brand and the size of the shape of the zeolite. So ASIP use 40 centimeter long and 8 cm diameter. And uh, some China made and uh, they'll be use 44 cm and 8 cm diameter. All these are cylinders and there will be, there's another model use 32 cm and 8 cm diameter cylinder. So 32 cm is the long of the cylinder, all that. So when you're going to do zeolite exchange, all this, you need to know what uh, components that you got inside this particular zeolite tank. So there's a spring and a nut and the O-ring. These are the O-ring that always uh, going to get leak, all that. Sometimes zeo the zeolite, Due to the vibration, all that you get o-ring leak. So eventually, the humid intent to go in and make the zeolite very hard. So they got a moving piston, all that, and you got a baffle. Both side you got a o-ring. So these o-ring are very important to avoid any leaking. So remember that. So, when you open 
severe tank, you have to be careful because there's a spring that uh, can uh, when you when you don't press it properly that ended up can pop off and uh, maybe someone going to get injured maybe yourself so always when you going to open this particular part of it always use uh, safety personal protective equipment so you remove the zeolite and clean the tank replace the old ring both side always remember replace the o-ring because the old o-ring may be damaged during the opening process so you need to replace the new one and uh, the canister to refill with new zeolite material each tank need almost 2.3 kilogram of new zeolite once you refill the zeolite you have to reassemble the serviette tank and confirm the top can and bottom can seal properly with new o-ring before doing pressure leak leakage test. So always remember when you open, you have to put it back at the same condition, but you need to replace the O-ring, all that, put it proper way. Then after you assemble everything, you need to do the test. So these are sample of zeolite, the new zeolite that you can get, the raw material. So these are step to disassemble the serviette tank. So you open the top part carefully uh, by removing the nut. So use safety goggles and other PPE because uh, sometimes you don't know the spring, all that. So make sure that you handle carefully with your PPE, uh, with, by using the PPE, all that. So open the nut carefully and ensure push down tightly on the cap to prevent the spring from moving. So the spring can pop off during the opening time, so it can jump out and maybe can hurt someone. So carefully remove the spring, and um, there's a moving piston there, So and a barrier paper. Be careful with the barrier paper because you want to reuse back the barrier paper. So Make sure that you open it carefully and remove it slowly. Yeah. Then at the at the bottom part, check the damage of the any damage and replace the o-ring on the both side of the tank. And Please check the baffle part of it at the bottom. And the stationary piston are in excellent condition. So if everything is good, you once you fill up everything, you can uh, start to uh, fill up with the zeolite, all that. But make sure everything is in good condition before you start to assemble with the new zeolite, all that. Please, the, when you remove the zeolite, you have to put it into dry canister or something like that. So that's your zeolite. That's how it looks like. So you remove the old one, clean everything, and reassemble back with the new zeolite. So that's how it, you see the spring and the baffle thing and the piston, moving piston, all that. So you, every single tank of this particular uh, Soviet tank you need roughly 2.3 kilogram of zeolite. So after install back with the new zeolite, all that, you have to make sure that your serviette tank is not leaking. It's very important. The reason is if there's some leaking, what happens is you're going to get pressure loss, then your oxygen output will be very low. So you have to remember that when you reassemble back, you need to do air compress test. So using air compressor, set somewhere 40 to 45 PSI and check by using your digital pressure meter, DPM4. Uh, is it inside the range of 40 to 45 PSI? So uh, the bottom part, you give a pressure of 40 to 45 PSI 
and you connect your DPM4 on the top of the Soviet tank. So then you pressurize the cylinder for 20 seconds and see if the reading of the DPM inside the range 40 to 45. Test for 20 seconds and see there's any leakage in the tolerance of plus minus 44.5 PSI. So after that, check using oxygen analyzer. Is it the reading somewhere 87 to 95? By installing to your oxygen concentrator, you can do that as well. So the pr pressure test is very important to make sure there's no leaking. So 40 to 45 compressor air and your DPM is connected on top of the Soviet tank and you see the reading, whether it's inside that range or not. So this is the diagram. You can see 40 to 45 PSI, compressed air going in to the zeolite and digital pressure meter is going on the top of it. So the bottom part, you only got one connection and the top part, you got two. One, you need to block another one you connect with DPM4 and you take the reading whether it's inside the range in 20 seconds. So if inside the 20 second, the reading is don't drop below 4.5, that means the leaking leak test is passed. So what do you need when you do um, Soviet tank replacement uh, of zeolite. You need to know the size of the cylinders and very important, you need to have 2.3 kilo to 2.5 kilo, depends on the model and the brand of uh, zeolite. And test tool is digital pressure meter, DPM4 and oxygen analyzer. And you need to have air compressor. If you don't have, you can use your oxygen um, air compressor, oxygen uh, co concentrator air compressor as well. But if you got air compressor separately, that will be good actually. Then the pricing of the zeolite, I did mention earlier, there's few type like 13X uh, HP molecule, Soviet, about $8 to $12 in the market price. And lithium base, $34 to $38. Logistic, it depends on the distance, so extra charges. So I'm not sure about the logistic, but this is the price range of the Zeolab. After you complete all the tests, install back your Zeolab, and you need to check the then, uh, pressure patient outlet but uh, 8 PSI and equalizer time 1 to 2 seconds. The equalizer valve it should change to 2 seconds. Then pressure reservoir tank should be 20 to 30 PSI. And half cycle on the high pressure should be 7 to 8 seconds. Filtering and flushing. The bottom valve should work somewhere seven to eight seconds, and pressure compressor should be somewhere twenty to thirty psi for complete unit, and pressure relief valve should be on the compressor fifty psi. So when you can, when you do all these particular tests, you you need to comply this particular reading. If your this particular thing work properly, that means it's good. And sometimes what happens is some of the valve full with uh, dust all that, you're going to get the pop no noise all that. So you have to be careful with that. You need to clean your valve sometime. At the same time, during uh, testing, before you go for testing, you need to ch change the product filter all this. Make sure the filter is new all that. And check any leakage on the tubing all that. Then do the testing and see if you complete 
your cycle with this particular information that that good that that means it's good at the same time you can use a checklist to verify with oxygen all that with oxygen analyzer all that and see the output so when you do zero right replacement always consider your safety issue things so health effect you have to be careful with the material because it's a powder type so it can be dusty all that so make sure that you use mask all that so handling um, make sure you do um, protective area no no wind all that so the dust doesn't uh, flew up all that so use a face mask or n95 all that and uh, make sure there's a better air ventilation for you guys during that period of time because uh, if you do on the closed room all that maybe sometimes the dust will be thrown everywhere so be careful when you uh, removing the zeolite uh, material so these are very important uh, thing that you need to follow like protective glove eye protection then make sure that you don't spill on the ground all this if you spill make sure that you do the cleaning all that so always make sure do it in the safe area and safe condition common alarm so uh, these are interesting part of it most of uh, oxygen concentrator i i seen experience that uh, you get oxygen concentrator with alarm but eventually you end up not doing troubleshooting but you end up removing the alarm cable so that's that's not that so good so always remember when you got alarm start to find out what's the alarm the reason of the alarm and most of the alarms you can go on the on the user manual so like short beep all this you can refer on the manual at the same time if we got beep all that uh short beep long noise pause all that and uh, oxygen concentrator not operating so make sure the power uh are checked like uh, maybe your power loss all that so insert the power and check by using multimeter and check whether you got voltage or not then continuous beep maybe the unit overheating or block air intake or not insufficient uh, air all that so make sure uh, you look into that so the solution is like removing and cleaning the cab cabinet filter and move the oxygen concentrator uh, uh, from the wall a bit somewhere one meter or something like that because sometimes you put very near you're going to block the air intake filter then ended up the oxygen concentrator going to heat up and rapid alarm maybe there's a tubing uh, pressure increase because the tubing is kink so you inspect the kink tube that you use on the patient all this so make sure the tubing is uh, the connection is proper and a proper air, air movement all that yellow or red alarm it depends on the brand as well uh, but most of them the red alarm light and continuous red light on so purity you get yellow or red alarm kink or block tubing the cannula is uh, not maybe kink or the humidifier is not working properly and the flow setting sometimes very low so you're going to get unwanted thing these are the problem that you're going going to cause during the with this alarm you need overheat due to the block of air intake so make sure you clean and replace and uh, replace the filter and uh, inspect the kink blockage all this and uh, check the flow set to one liter per minute and remove and clean the cabinet filter move the concentrator at least three inch or one meter away from the from the wall 
So all these are very important. Sometimes you're going to push near to the wall, yeah, don't get flow. So when you do troubleshooting, always have an observation of listening the machine sound. So like make sure the function functional check is important. So listen for any abnormal sound like check the switching time, the valve switching time, all that. If any abnormal noise, the oxy oxygen concentrator, uh, you need to check and close the loop. What's the status like the- You've never heard it, have you? LED, all that. Yeah. And uh, check the control board light movement. Depends on the model. And many concentrator have port, high pressure and low pressure port to test. So use pressure gauge or digital pressure meter to check the high pressure and low pressure output. So the unit run, but low pressure, low flow, and high pressure condition. So connect the test uh, gauge on Soviet bed test, test point and uh, check the pressure. Is it low or not? and refer to the operation sequence, the cycling of the valve. And if the bed pressure is rising slowly, check the occlusion of the filter and leaking point, all that. If the filter is clean, there's no leak, then check the compressor. Maybe the compressor have some uh, defect, it's not performing very well. Then if the relief pressure, uh, relief valve pressure is releasing some pressure, and check the cycle of cycle of the pressure. Is it properly or not? Uneven pressure on the equalizer valve. Maybe not operating correctly. So check the uneven pressure on the serviette bed and check the equalizer valve. Because sometimes low pressure can cause few components from bottom to top. So you need to check by sequence. So compressor will not start when the unit is turned on. So verify the cooling fan running or not. If not, check the power line. Maybe there's something wrong with the connection. And uh, check the fuse, all this. If it's uh, good condition or not. Then check the compressor voltage and compressor co connection. Very important. If the voltage is there, maybe the starter cap capacitor is not working properly or compressor defect. The voltage not uh, present on the wire harness, maybe the cable are not working properly or broken. So oxygen con concentrator run on continuous cycle but have low oxygen concentrator. So it can be high pressure indicate defect of severe bed, low pressure indicate occlude, filter leak, defect compressor, uneven bed, indicate valve not operating. Sometimes and due to the humid, the severe bed become harder, so you get uneven uh, reading as well. So check for oxygen leak at severe bed, flow meter, the end product tank, and uh, check the uh, bacteria filter, is it any blockage or not, or broken, and check the valve, and outlet port, all that. All right. Well, Guna, thank you so much for um, for that information. Um, I just want to remind everybody: if you have any questions, any comments, anything that you'd like us to come back to. Um, please kindly make note of it in the chat box. That way we know. Um, and if not, at the towards the end of the session, we'll open it up for discussion. So feel free to speak up at that time. Um, I want to very quickly um, um, introduce um, Ashaber, who is with um, Tech Bharat Polytechnic College out in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Um, and uh, we've, we've partnered with Tech Bharat to do some biomed training um, initiatives in Ethiopia. And today we have him and his team 
um, who will share some of their experiences in repairing and maintaining oxygen concentrators in Addis Ababa. So Ashabur, please feel free to introduce your team. Hello, guys. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, I'm Ashabur from, from Addis Ababa Tagwarad, uh, the head of biomedical equipment technology department. Here we are four. I think uh, I am Ashabur, and the second is Meva, Wendy, and Osera is here. And uh, our presentation is, uh, is maybe, uh, I think, two sessions. The first one is the presented by Meva on just about the standard operating procedure and the decontamination guidelines, how the machine is accepted from the, uh, to when, you are, when, is, when it is the equipment is arrived to our workshop and how we can maintain, how the guy we can decontaminate those machines, especially since it is, we, they bring, we bring it from the hospital. So it's need to contaminate this equipment. So she's going to be present on the first session, the standard operating, uh, procedure and uh, decontamination guidelines. And uh, the second session is uh, presented by Opsera. Uh, it is more about the maintenance of oxygen concentrator, the case, what we'll face and how we can solve uh, while we are maintaining this oxygen concentrator. I think it's a time to present now for Mava. She's just uh, prepared on SOP and the guide decontamination guidelines. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ashabur. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Meba. Uh, I'm a biomedical trainer at Agarit. Uh, so I'll, I'll proceed with the part that I will present. What you see now is the maintenance workflow chart that uh, we use when we do maintenance. So in this tax, uh, part, we have uh, nine processes uh, that we do. So the first one is acceptance. This is the part where we accept medical equipment from hospitals. And in this part, we will visually check if the equipment is clean or not, and also fill an application form and then verify uh, what the, whether the claim that the user, in this case, the biomedical engineer made is correct or not. Uh, so uh, usually whenever we accept, we consider every medical equipment contaminated, but because most of our, uh, the equipment that arrive here are already very visually dirty, We've made a, a decontamination guideline where we uh, submitted it to the Ministry of Health and uh, every hospital biomedical engineer is expected to clean it and that's why in the acceptance test we visually check it and accept. Uh, so the next step is before decontamination we would do a disassembly and that is we unplug uh, any accessory and power cord on it. Uh, we remove the battery if it has any, and any mountable, mounted units like, uh, for example, a humidifier on oxygen concentrator or a EMS module on a monitor, we dismount it. And then we continue with the next uh, process, which is the contamination. Uh, so in the decontamination, I already have a uh, a slide coming up that would describe very briefly. So I will go to the next process now that is assembly. Uh, that is just putting back everything together. Everything that should be mounted, we put it back in. The battery, we put it back in. And uh, we plug all the power cords and accessories. The next one is pre maintenance check. So and we, in our workshop, we have four areas. The first area is the de uh, decontamination area. The, that area we decontaminate, it's, it's literally outside of uh, uh, the workshop. We do it in the veranda. 
so that uh, the equipment, the contaminated equipment does not go to the workshop. And we have another area, the maintenance check area, where the equipments go. And uh, the asset numbers would be provided. And we would uh, bring the service. We would try to get the service and user manual if the user have it, bring it. And then we identify the problem. And then we would go to maintenance once we identified it. And using a standard operation procedure, we maintain. So we also have another slide for this, a basic one. But uh, since you're following this as this training, I'm sure you already know how maintenance procedures follow. And after maintenance, the next step is integration of accessories. So this is the part where we make sure the equipment have the, all the accessories that are needed and we would plug in all the accessories and they get the equipment ready for test and analysis. Uh, and then we would, uh, the next step is test and analysis. This is the part where we use uh, simulators and test, do performance testing. Uh, was, I think last week, uh, the Chasa and Mohammed have already presented one performance test that they did on ventilators. So uh, this is different for uh, each equipment uh, and we use different analyzers and we test it. And if it is, uh, if it passes, then it goes to the last step. But if it doesn't, it's, if it fails, we, it goes back to the maintenance section. Uh, and after it passes, it's decommissions. It's, it's decommissioned. That means we give the equipment back to the hospitals uh, and give user training. We recommend. Uh, so we give recommendation stuff. So when I would go to the next slide now. So documentation. So documentation, uh, this is something that we all know we should have, but we don't really want to do it. But it is an essential part of maintenance. Uh, documentation is the way we show what we've done and how we did it. Uh, so for the nine processes that we go to, we uh, have four documents. We have acceptance documents, we have maintenance documents, we have test and analysis and decommissioning documents. So for uh, each of the, this document, uh, for example, for the accessory form, you would see in the next slide, I would describe it more. Uh, but all these documents, if not for all eight, for at least for this four documents, for acceptance, for maintenance, for test and analysis and for decommissioning, you should have documents. In acceptance, you would list all the accessories the user bring. And uh, the history, you have uh, the history and the status of the equipment and the owner information so that we could also call them if in between we want more information. And in the maintenance section, we, we list out uh, what we did, the troubleshooting we've done, and if there is another spare parts and accessories necessary, we also put that down in the maintenance form. And um, yeah, uh, for the taste and analysis, like I said before, it's different for each equipment. Uh, so for all this documentation, uh, there are a standard documentation formats which you could use and like i said you should already have it but if you haven't we could also provide samples of this documentation uh, and in all the documentation there should be an equipment detail that is the asset number hospital name equipment name model serial number and manufacturing this all tells you uh what the equipment Sorry, I think the slide is gone now. Okay, 
this should tell you what the equivalent is. This is the equivalent information in the, for the asset number. If you see the right corner of the, uh, I will go back to the first, yeah. For the asset number, if you go, if you see the picture of the patient monitors on the uh, right corner, right bottom corner, maybe you could see the asset tags so that each equipment can be identified. Uh, so the next slide uh, is a, a document sample where we do, this is acceptance checklist. It has the equipment details and the accessories, what the hospital has brought, the history. This history is very important because uh, it tells you what the machine has been going through. Like it's like uh, doctors ask for patients uh, history, the symptoms you ask we asked the users, the biomedical technicians, and we put this in the list. And the last one is the owner's information. The uh, right corner, the picture you see, is one of our colleagues uh, looking through service manuals to prepare for the test and analysis forms. Uh, I'll go to the next slide now. Yeah, so the contamination process. Uh, this process, we start with personal protective equipment. We prepare all the personal protective equipment. That means masks, gowns, gloves, goggles, goggles if possible, so that we protect ourselves first. So we decontaminate all equipment because we consider all equipment contaminated. And for uh, this decontamination process, it's usually cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, but this last sterilization we don't use because uh, the equipments that we use are non-immersible because they are electrical and battery operated. Uh, we use many immersion techniques because the equipments will be damaged and we only do cleaning and disinfection. So after using personal protective equipments, uh, we gather all the tools that are necessary. I think you'll find this in this guide, uh, guideline, the contamination guideline we have made. We would share it with uh, assist team and they could share it with you. Uh, it tells you all the uh, cleaning, the personal protective equipment that you could use. It tells, tells you the tools and supplies and the cleaning and disinfecting agents that you could use. But what is recommended, what we recommend is that uh, use the cleaning and disinfectant agents that the manufacturer recommends because the cleaning material that you use might not be compatible with the device. Uh, if you add one cleaning agent to another cleaning agent, it might not be com com chemically compatible. So uh, the guideline that we used is only uh, we recommend it only when you cannot find the uh, manufacturer recommendation. So it's simple cleaning. So the first, the next step is disassembly, like I said earlier, and then if we clean it. Uh, cleaning is uh, using water and then lighting flows. Uh, first with this detergent and and then uh, with warm water, we clean it. And then we use disinfectant based on manufacturer's recommendation. And then we leave it to air dry. That means just leave the equipment and wait until uh, it's dry. So while doing this, we make sure that moisture is not uh, entering into the equipment because it would damage it. So the pictures you see on the right side is us uh, cleaning comp the compressor units. So after cleaning the outer surface, we clean the inside uh, with a blower, we blow dry it, and that's what you see. I will go to the next slide now. 
Yeah, so the troubleshooting steps. These steps are um, uh, like you might all be familiar with this. This uh, we got from uh, Jumma University PowerPoints. So the first step is preparation. That is always, always use personal protective equipment, be careful of electric shocks, and gather information. The next step, step one, the first step observation, is just use your senses. Smell, look, hear what the equipment, the sound the equipment makes. Uh, and also pay attention to past history that we already had from the acceptance checklist format. And the next step is define problem area. That is uh, like use logical and reasoning to determine the problem area. And the third step is identifying possible cause. There might be many causes to one problem, so it's just using your mind and analyzing which could be the right cause. Uh, and the, la the fourth one is determine most probable cause. So most probable cause, like there are a uh, uh, list, there are components or stuff that are easily breakable, like uh, components that burn out or wear, like fuses and switches are highly likely to happen. Uh, like components that generate heat, transformers, uh, and the coil humans and connection, post connection is very highly likely to happen and the like, defective wiring. So all this from the first to the fourth step is done without opening the equipment. It's just to analyze it. And then this fifth step is testing and repairing where you test the cause the stuff that you suspect. And then do follow up. So follow up is documentation of course on the maintenance format if there is necessary to have spare parts, list of spare parts and accessories. Uh, and then do test and analysis and then user training and technical support. So I will go to the next slide now. So uh, what makes troubleshooting very easy is to understand the system. And to understand the system, Asking these three questions is very essential. The first one is how it operates. That means you see the input. The, what kind of supplies does it need? Is it battery operated? Is it electrical? Does it need, like for example, oxygen concentrator? It requires. Uh, it requires gas, like air, to work. So, and then you see how it's. Does it see the process? Like how does it uh, get the air inside? Pressure, you think. How does it get nitrogen out and produce oxygen? So with this, when you think about the processes, uh, you would know uh, what the machine does. And the next step, the outputs, is what it does. So. If you ask yourself these three questions, it would make maintenance very easy. So, yeah. The next slide, my favorite slide, uh, is always remember a kiss. That is, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, you have no idea how many hours that you could lose just by thinking of the problem as it is complex. So, on step three of the troubleshooting, identifying possible cause, you might run into more than one causes. So, when you run into more than one causes, choose the simplest one. The simplest of the two is the most likely to be true. And that saves a lot of time. So, yeah. Uh, if you need more explanation, I would explain. I would leave the floor to Obsera now to do the next slides. Thank you.
Okay, okay. Thank you, Mbaba. I'm Sierra Abito, and I'm a biomedical technical trainer at Al Sawa Tadbari Polytechnic College. And um, yeah. I'm going to present uh, uh, maintenance uh, activity we uh, encountered uh, during our work activity in the last three weeks. Um, um, it is mostly done on UJ oxygen concentrator, specifically. More uh, UA oxygen concentrator is present and more, uh, more uh, distributed in uh, Ethiopian um, hospital. So um, we use uh, the service manual to prepare this case study. Um, uh, the common pillar or the common problem we counter during our maintenance uh, um, activities are um, the first one is machine stopping running after a few uh, how of minutes at the start is but it's so um, working after a minute or after a how uh, this is a, what the main problem we encounter during our activities uh, the second problem or the second common pillar we encounter is a low oxygen concentration at our um, so um, this is uh, uh, normally, we, we face this problem on, in all uh, oxygen concentrators we receive from the hospital because uh, another problem uh, causes the output to be uh, low in oxygen concentration, uh, concentration and, and the other one is oxygen delivery at low pressure and uh, or at high pressure. Uh, this is uh, the other problem we face uh, during our activity. Um, the fourth one is machine stop, uh, totally uh, stop uh, running. Uh, that means when we just uh, collect the machine or uh, make it on, it does not run anyway. So this is also uh, another problem that you encounter during our activities. And the fifth uh, case or the fifth common failure we uh, face is uh, a machine runs but no Plus outputs. Uh, that means the machine is running. Um, it seems it's working, uh, working properly, but if there's no ga gases at output or there's no patient uh, gas delivery to the patient, there's also another problem that we um, face in our activity. Uh, when we come to case one, in case one, in case one, uh, the machine stop running after a few minutes or hours at a race uh, before. And the cause for this uh, problem, as we identified as um, uh, the cause for this problem, um, the pressure or oxygen concentration sensor senses above or below operating range. That means um, oxygen concentrator have a pressure sensor and um, oxygen concentration sensor uh, as a part or as a component. So when this machine first runs and after a time when it sends um, a concentration of oxygen delivered for the patient or a pressure of a gas or oxygen gas delivered to the patient if it is um, out of range that means if it is above or below operating ranges it um, fails or to stop uh, by itself this is uh, one um, causes the other one is a dust on an um, electronic component that means on a PCB board, an oxygen sensor board, or dust particle blockage and, and, and airway. So those are the cause for this um, uh, case. That means this causes um, a machine to stop after a while or after it uh, runs uh, for a few minutes. As a solution, we use um, to fix this problem. Just we clean the dust particle and check um, the sensor, um, oxygen sensor or barrier sensor, uh, and then we just use analyzer to uh, read the um, uh, barrier outputs and the oxygen concentration analyzer to normally check the um, outputs and oxygen concentration. So. Um, um, if there is any um, dust particle in the airways or in the um, PCB board, uh, electronic component, we just clean that one and normally we um, fix this problem in uh, this ways. Um, but um, if there is 
uh, if this um, case, this means in, uh, Martian is uh, soap running after a time, uh, we get uh, error or alarms and UG oxygen concentrator. I don't know if it is, it is used for all, but in the UG oxygen concentrator, E1 or E2 or LO, that means E1 is low oxygen pressure, uh, uh, E2 is high oxygen pressure, and LO is uh, low oxygen concentrator. This error uh, message is displayed on the screen. So uh, by following this, following this uh, message, we also confirm um, the course and uh, uh, accordingly the condition of fixing activities. So as you see on and in the image, we have a dust um, on circuit boards, and um, uh, we have a leakage on a solenoid valve here. Um, that means um, if there is um, a leakage that causes a low pressure player, low pressure delivery to the patient, so the machine has to uh, work. Next slide. And case two, in uh, case two, uh, we encounter uh, low oxygen concentration output or, or low oxygen delivery, low oxygen concentration delivery to the patient. Uh, the cause for this uh, problem is um, um, dirty filter or dirty tubes and cranked or finger pneumatic tube or airways and uh, also if there is um, if the zonates um, zonate expired uh, the output oxygen concentration gets low so um, those are the case we are at the cause we identified um, as um, uh, as a uh, a, pro a problem, uh, uh, the oxygen, uh, 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 low, low oxygen concentration delivered to the patient. So this causes uh, these problems. As a solution, we just use those activities, including the filter. Uh, that means we have intake uh, filter, or we have a compressor intake filter, gross filter, or we have also HEPA filter. We clean those and uh, um, uh, normally we. Uh, 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 fixes the problem for uh, Martians. And the other problem uh, with the related with this one is a replacement of zeolates. So because the zeolates expire, it works um, about this one. Uh, on another cases, uh, the zeolate is just full of moisture. The moisture is uh, entered into the zeolates and uh, um, at the blocks or it uh, lowers the uh, pressures delivery to the patients and we replace this um, as the latest. That one, the other one is just normally um, when the um, a nurse or even users um, connect this, the nasal tube to the patient, there may be a kink um, or crack, so uh, this causes the oxygen to the liver to the low. And uh, we get um, LO as an error message displayed on the screen in this brandis. As you see on the image, there is a dirty tube, a dirty filter, and a low oxygen. Low oxygen deliver 40.9 uh, percentage of oxygen concentration delivered to the patient. This is the first one we did, uh, the oxygen the concentrator, but uh, we just uh, correct this and uh, it come up to 19 percentage. And this, uh, the other image on the right side uh, shows LO. Uh, that means low oxygen concentration and the error uh, message displayed on the screen. Uh, in case three, we have two uh, cases. Case one, uh, case three A. Um, case one is oxygen delivery at low pressure to the patient. Uh, this is caused due to uh, blockage of tube or dirty canister intake uh, filter, intake uh, filter or gross filter. That means um, in a canister below uh, or in this we have um, 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 a filter. Uh, it is just act as a, it's used as a filter if it's blocked, so uh, it lowers the pressure uh, delivered to or the pressure output from the canister or from t bridge. So if it's blocked, it causes um, a low pressure at the end or the at, uh, output. The other one is a leakage. Um, and the, if there is a leakage at the tube connection or in um, 
an solenoid valve or an equalizer or at, um, outlet connection that causes a low pressure delivery to the patient. So this just um, a give alarm or give message and a sort of uh, running the machine. The machine uh, stop itself uh, after a while. The other one is pressure regulator at just a low level. That means the, if pressure regulator is adjusted at low level, uh, uh, low level um, pressures, it delivers to the patient as well. That means it causes a uh, low uh, pressure outputs. The other one is low air compression. If there is um, a, a defective, de defective compre compressor, that means if compressor is defected, that causes low air compression. This causes uh, low um, uh, delivery of uh, um, uh, gas pressure at the outlets. As solution, those are causes which causes um, which causes which results low pressure, but we just use uh, those uh, activities or solution to fix the problem. The first one, we just check the tube uh, to see if it is blocked, or we clean the filter, or, and we check the tube for crack or tighten. Uh, to uh, the tube if it is loosened. That means we tighten the tube if, if there is a loosened connection and we adjust the pressure um, I mean pressure regulator to a correct ring in such a way just we um, correct us or fixes a problem with the different machine which delivers low, low um, pressure at outputs. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, case B, case 3B, that means in uh, case 3, other cases, now we have also uh, oxygen delivery at high pressure to the patient or at output. So, this is also another problem. Um, uh, so, the cause for this problem is um, narrow tubing. Um, um, a diameter due to dust particles between and, and, and pneumatic pathways, and the other one is a pressure regulator just at high level. Uh, so, um, in this case, high pressure delivery to the patient, uh, maybe um, mostly it is uh, occurred due to a narrowing uh, diameter, diameter of the tube. So, we clean the tube, um, inside part of the tube, and normally we get um, 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 correct output or um, uh, normal pressure output at the uh, flow meter. We clean the dust particle and then adjust the regulator to the normal operating range. In this case, we get um, E2 error message um, in this brands, UJ brand, that we are considering UJ brands. So uh, this shows um, the uh, gas delivered at high pressure to the patient if E2 is um, uh, displayed on the uh, screen. Next case. Next. Uh, case four. In this case, uh, the machine does not functioning when switch on. That means it stop working. Even though we plug, we give the power to the machine and make it on. It does not um, run or the machine totally is uh, working. Uh, this uh, this case in this case it is normally uh, related with um, electrical uh, or power supply system. Um, we identified um, uh, four cases, uh, causes that uh, uh, cause machine uh, stop working. Uh, so uh, the first one is electrical wire disconnection. That means um, uh, maybe power receptacle or power cordes or um, it may be um, any wire connecting to electrical components. Uh, it may be a starting capacitor, starting capacitor may fail, or its connection may be, it may be uh, disconnected, or may just if, if there is um, a loose uh, connection of um, capacitor, 
uh, since it is a starting capacitor, it starts as a compressor to compress the air. If capacitor fails, the machine will start um, uh, compressing the, uh, the air. The other one is compressor failure. The com compressor may fail because the wind burns or there may be disconnection of um, power supplying cable to uh, compressor. And the other one is electrical component failure. For example, we just phases um, um, transformer and relay uh, failure on a PCB board. We have a PCB board displayed on, on the right side and we have um, a transformer and we have um, uh, a relay which controls solenoid valves. So if these two parts are failed and we replace those uh, parts or harvest from another equipment and we fix the problem. So as a solution, we normally check electrical connection if, and we just tighten connection if there is a loosened connection and just we replace capacitor in one case and and we check motor winding and replace it necessary. That means this just that these are the activity we do uh, this um last uh, this two last weeks. That means we normally we just replace um uh, motors uh, I mean comp compressor in one machine and just we check another circuit components such as transformer tools and uh, relay which are found on um, circuit boards. And if if um, if uh, the power is not reach uh, PCB and we just make the machine on, we get a continuous um, alarm, sounding alarms. And that means even though the power is delivered to the machine, the machine is not uh, working. That's just yes. Try this one. Let's next slide. Uh, this is the I think the last. Um, cases we encounter while, while doing our own, just doing our activities. No gas output when the machine is turned it on. The machine is working normally. Uh, it runs, compressor compresses, it gases, uh, but there's no uh, oxygen at outputs. So these are uh, another challenge we face or encounter while uh, we are doing our activities. Uh, the cause for this problem, the, we identified the cause uh, as a block, a block check valve. This that means we have a solenoid valve which delivers um, um, compressed gas to uh, sieve beds. Uh, uh, so we get a failed solenoid valve and disconnected tube or leakage. That means if um, there is a leakage um, uh, or the disconnected tube, uh, the gas is not delivered. Uh, to the patient, a blocked HEPA filter or bacterial filter, or totally blockage of uh, uh, inlet or uh, compressor inlet filter, those causes uh, uh, these problems. That means you get the machine is turned on, but machine is working, it's functioning, it's running, but there's no uh, gas at output. Those causes normally um, uh, happen the machine to be um, out of. Uh, workers as a solution, just we replace this uh, solenoid valve in um, uh, mass in one machines, or also uh, due to over pressure, um, uh, the tube may uh, loosen or get leak uh, leaks. So we tighten those um, connection by using cable ties and normally the, ma the machine is um, functioning normally and we clean and replace HEPA filter or intake or grass filter. We did all this. We cleaned HEPA as well as um, intake and the grass filter and we drain it, then we replace. Turns out the machine is uh, properly um, working. That means it gives um, normal um, oxygen concentration at outputs. And in in um, UJ brands, E3 is um, um, displayed on uh, displays as um, open compressor or open airways. That means if there is a leakage or if compressor is uh, totally uh, not compressing air to the tip, the sieve it, it displays E3 on um, on 
that is uh, the machines display parts. So on the right part, as you have seen, we have a, a loosened um, tube, and also we have a, a solenoid one uh, that are normally disconnected tubes from solenoid valve because of this machine totally not giving um, a gas at the output, but it runs, it runs but we do not get uh, oxygen gas at outputs. Uh, 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 these are uh, normally the, our activity that we did in the, the image that shows our activity we did in, uh, while we did our uh, maintenance. Uh, so this also shows uh, works on our workshops. I think uh, this is the end of the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Absara. We, we appreciate that brilliant presentation. Um, thank you so much. I, I want to uh, give a shout out also to uh, Biomed from Musoma uh, in Tanzania, our Musoma Biomed team, who did a phenomenal job in, um, in uh, putting together pictures that allowed for Guna to explain about taking apart the, um, the sieve tanks. And so all of these pictures came in from our Musoma Biomed team uh, that uh, went through great length to take detailed pictures so they could share this uh, with all of you. So thank you, Musoma Biomed team. And once again, to Meba, Obsera, Wendy, and Ashaber and team from TechButtered, thank you so much for giving us some insight into your workflow charts, into your overall protocols for um, accepting medical devices, maintaining medical devices, including the decontamination uh, procedures. Um, I hope that everybody on this call has learned um, and maybe learned from the experiences of our Ethiopian counterparts and how they are addressing uh, maintenance as it relates to um, oxygen therapy devices or oxygen concentrators. Um, I want to differ now very quickly to Erin. Um, I suppose we may have some questions that we can try to answer. Um, and uh, I'd like for Dr. Matt as well um, to give us some concluding thoughts uh, um, in, in a bit. So, Erin, over to you. Um, my internet's still in and out, so feel free to jump back in if you can't hear me. Um, I don't see any immediate questions in the chat. I do want to address that we will be sending out the PowerPoint slides, as always. Um, if you registered for this session, you gave us your email. So we'll send the slides and the recording to that email in the next couple of days. Um, you can also go to our website. Um, I've left it in the chat. It's assistinternational.org slash COVID-19 resources. And that's where you can actually see all of our sessions so far, including this one. And it usually gets uploaded within about 24 hours. Um, if there are any questions, you can feel free to hit the raise hand button. Um, and then we can unmute you and let you speak to us. If you want me to read out your question, you can go ahead and leave that in the chat. I see, I see a question from Damien, a friend of ours from Tanzania. He's doing some incredible work with Touch Foundation in the Lake Zone. Um, Damien was asking to our Ethiopian counterparts, how are you containing the contaminants if you are cleaning the machine right outside as I see in the photo. So I think he may be talking about um, this photo. Um, how are you containing the contaminant if you're cleaning the machine right outside as I see in the photos? Ashaber, Meba, do you want to maybe take a stab at answering these questions, uh, this question? Dr. Maz, maybe you can uh, speak to this as well. So, Okay, we're waiting now for Dr. Matt, I think. No, Meba, please feel free to contribute. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, we clean the equipment outside. Uh, uh, I'm not sure actually what, what, if I understand the question, I'm trying to look at it in the comments, uh, the chat section 
where the question is? Uh, Mama, the question, the question mm -hmm. is that uh, if we do the decontamination and cleaning outside, mm -hmm. uh, how do we contain, if it's for example, the device coming from any COVID uh, site, let's say. Okay. We assume every, every device coming in has COVID, let's say. So the question yeah. was, if we clean it in open air and leave it outside, how do we contain the contaminants so that they don't contaminate the people or other, you know, transmission? That was the so, question. If I okay. So uh, as we all know, for COVID, it's actually uh, good, good if uh, the area that uh, you are is more... Uh, free and um, like if the air goes around you have less chance it's less likely that you would get the uh, virus uh, so that's why we don't get it into our workshop of course on its way to us it would contaminate uh, like everywhere it goes uh, that's why we actually also developed the guideline. It's it's not only COVID that uh, is uh, a risk. It's also hepatitis B, hepatitis C, influenza. There are many cases, and that's why we made a guideline so that the biomedical engineers can decontaminate before the equipment leaves there. Uh, workshops or its respective departments but if they don't do it uh, before they get it we get it uh, in the first place we also like i said before consider it contaminated we don't bring it to our workshop where it is um confidence confident con what is the word <laughs> uh, I could not find the, um, the, the English word, but if there's a Nitajana Nekabota, it's the Amharic version. <laughs> the, yeah, so. Dr. Matt, can you translate that for us? Confiscated <laughs> <laughs> area? Like, uh, an area where air cannot be freely transmitted. Like, An transmitted area? Excuse me, Gunnar, what did you say? Is it congested area? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Congested area. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if it is congested area, our team is more likely to have the uh, virus or uh, hepatitis C virus or to be easily transmitted to our other tools and stuff. And that's why we do it outside. And it's actually the, for the patient monitors, we do it on the corner. We break out tables and we do it on the corner. But for this oxygen concentrators, we use blowers. It would be very good if we, would, if we, we could use vacuum cleaners instead of blowers so that it sucks the air in and not distribute it out because uh, blower is the only thing we have available now. We blow it and we tr try to keep ourselves as far as away and blow it. And yeah, that's why we do it outside. I hope I answered the question. I think you additionally, did. Yeah, yeah, additionally, what I'm, uh, I just to add it uh, beside to my boss said, uh, if you look at this area, this area is more, uh, I think it is, um, it is far from our workshop and uh, this place is, it's not actually it's, uh, a place where most of the, people are not coming to this area, especially for the, our colleges and stuff. So this place is, I think it is a very safe and uh, most of the people are not, uh, way, is not any way to visit this area. It is not like a road for the people. So I think this place is, we are already selected since uh, most of the people is come to, is not came to, are not came to this area and it's not congested. It's this maybe it is free when we are blowing and uh, cleaning this machine. I think maybe it's all those virus and I don't, I, I hope it's not to be contaminated the whole people since <laughs> most of the people are not visited this area uh, frequently. Yeah. So it is maybe safe 
for our not only for our staff but also for the uh, college uh, society it is a very safe area and uh, most of the people doesn't visit this area that's the reason why we cleaning uh, select this place for the contamination uh, contaminating area that's it that sounds good, Ashabur. Thank you so much. And Meba, thank you so much for that explanation. Um, I, I want to add a quick thought to this also. Um, I think it was as of yesterday, CDC had updated um, their um, um, some, some guidelines as it relates to how the virus spreads. And now there seems to be evidence that the virus does not spread easily uh, by touch or by touching contaminated surfaces or objects. Um, when they did the study in the labs, they found that the virus stays alive for a while um, on these surfaces. So still make sure you uh, take on proper hand hygiene and contact precautions. But it seems like the primary way uh, the virus transmits from person to person uh, is, uh, you know, it's from, per uh, from person to person is through um, by, by being, people being close to each other, uh, being near to each other, um, cough, the droplets that are, um, that are released when you speak, uh, those are the ways that it transfers and not necessarily by touching contaminated surfaces. So we'll give you some more information on that in the coming weeks as we understand more of these new guidelines and we'll make sure to update our files. That way um, you have the most accurate information. But thank you so much, Ethiopia team. And Damien, that was a great question. Also to add maybe one more thing, uh, because, I, hello? Maz, we can hear you, yes. Yeah, yeah good. So uh, in fact, now currently the medical device being you know, brought to Tagwarad are not coming from COVID hospitals. So, because if, if they are really coming from a hospital that is currently actively treating patients, I would suggest more care should be taken. But as of now, all these devices are coming from, you know, uh, other hospitals who are preparing themselves for any more, you know, COVID outbreak in the future. So just to add this comment. Uh, thanks, Maz. That was good. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Any more questions? You can raise your hand, you can um, unmute yourself, you can put the question in the chat. Yes, Mr. Omari Pinda. Okay, hello everybody there. I think everybody's doing fine. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to appreciate the presentation which I've done by Guna concerning about features and working principle of uh, oxygen concentrator, as well as uh, uh, I, would, I would like also to appreciate the team from Addis Ababa for case studies, which show us uh, different cases of the problem which is associated with uh, oxygen concentrator and how can be solved. Now, on top of that, I have two questions. The first question is, for me, I would like to know exactly how do the oxygen sensor work, the working principle? Because from review, I have found out that some of the oxygen sensors, which are not used in medical devices, uh, the working principle is by use by measuring potential difference between reference oxygen and measured oxygen. So my eager is to know how exactly these oxygen sensors are doing in order to determine the amount of oxygen on that concentrator. That is question number one. Question number two, it's like advice because according to all features which we have seen from um, oxygen concentrator, some of them are available on market. For instance, if I have eager to have a prototype of oxygen concentrator, 
which I can produce myself maybe from my project and then having a short list of all equipment which are available on market. Now my, 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 my question that do I need only to reach a threshold of nine to 95 percentage of oxygen? What if I get maybe from 60 going above? Because on that way, it means that I've already improved the concentration from 21%, maybe up to 60. So my doubt is about the exactly threshold. Is only 92, 95, or below that, maybe above 50 is acceptable. Thank you. Wow, those are loaded questions. Um, Gunnar, how quickly can you answer the mechanism of an oxygen sensor? Okay, oxygen sensor, you got uh, three types. Um, uh, remember, your even your car use oxygen sensor to measure the carbon line and uh, oxygen uh, out, uh, line. That's for the car, but for the normal oxygen sensor that you use in medical, there's two types. One is using a material called uh, supplement some uh, start with Z um, call um, zirconia zirconic zirconic or D yeah zirconian zirconian is one of it that um, it's been pressed on the sensor itself let me take the sensor I think I got the sensor um, so it press on the sensor so with the sensor Okay, I got a sensor here. So, when uh, you give an air on that particular line, it's going to convert that particular sensor into millivolt and uh, going to send signal to your, to your display. For example, that's your uh, oxygen display. That's going to measure the millivolt, but you do the conversion in, uh, in percentage. So 21%, the millivolt can be somewhere 10 millivolt, and it uh, measure up to 120. So normally they do what? They do calibration on 21 and 100 to make sure the ratio line is inside that particular thing. Another, another type sensor they use is a ultrasound sensor. So when ox a normal air, the density of the air will be uh, different compared to oxygen. So the ultrasound will send us a wave signal. So when, um, when the oxygen go through that particular wave uh, intend to hit the oxygen and eventually when it reach to the point less, that means the oxygen is a lot of oxygen is traveling through that particular tube. So this is two method that normally you're going to see. Okay. okay? Thank you. That's for oxygen sensor. So yeah, even, even even in uh, your oxygen concentrator, there's two type sensors they use. Some of it they use this type of sensor and ultrasound, but the accuracy level ultrasound is a bit lower, but the lifespan of the ultrasound oxygen sensor is much more longer compared to a normal one. A normal one will take one to two years. Maybe in a follow-up session, we can go through some more specifics of the different kinds of oxygen sensors, um, yep. uh, Mr. Pinda. Um, also, um, Guna, he was asking the question about the purity of oxygen coming out of an oxygen concentrator. Um, early on in your presentation, you had mentioned 92 to 95 percent purity. And his question yep. was, what about oxygen concentrators that produce at 60%? Uh, because that is still concentrating and improving from the normal 21% available in air to 60%. I agree with that. It's above 21, but for your lung, you need at least above 85. For medical purpose, it should be a lot 
so the healing process will be much more faster. 60 is not that so good enough, actually. So it should be above 85, 86. That's, that's a good output, actually. Yeah, and, and we could try to put some more um, some more information around that um, because uh, your blood oxygen uh, is different from the oxygen being put out from equipment, right? And so ultimately you're measuring for uh, blood oxygen, uh, the pulse oximeter, to make sure that stays above um, 88 or 90 percent. Um, and, um, and so in order to achieve that, you know, you increase or decrease your oxygen flow. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised. I've never had to deal with oxygen concentrators that put out at 60% purity. Um, I've always seen them operate above the 90% range. And I'm gonna have you come across any? And, and uh, another, another important thing, most of this oxygen uh, concentrator that uh, they, they, are, they got an alarm built in together. So what happened is, when it reduces below the actual value, it's going to indicate some alarms. So it shouldn't normally, it uh, depends on the manufacturer, but normally it shouldn't go below 85. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say this is also, I mean, uh, uh, you know, oxygen is a drug at the end of the day. And also it depends on the physician who prescribes oxygen because you know we provide oxygen to a patient where you know his or her lung is not functioning properly or effectively meaning that in order to get as much you know saturation of oxygen in the arterial blood as possible then it means that we need to avail good oxygen at the lung at least so that there could be enough oxygen exchange in the alveoli i would say yeah. so i think this is also a bit clinical but uh, yeah, we could we could also go more in that line. We talked about this, I believe, last week as well. And um, somebody, I believe it was the Musoma team, brought up a very good point that you may need to convey to clinical users. Um, Guna, I believe that as you increase the volume of concentration, the purity of oxygen goes down, assuming the same yes. concentrator is used. Do you want to explain how that works and um, why? Maybe okay, not when you, intuitive. Yeah, when you increase your flow um, uh, more, what happens is your, your um, oxygen uh, Soviet tank intend to pressurize more. So ended up what happens is uh, the flow flow line will be much more faster. So that that what happens is uh, when the flow increase the purity drop a bit. That, that's a normal thing because you, you're sending out more air and uh, you ended up you're getting uh, less purity. But normally it doesn't drop so much, but it will be in that particular range. Mm, yeah. Those were some great questions uh, uh, from Omari Pinda. Thank you so much for your contribution. Do we have any more questions or comments? Maybe uh, uh, if we could share our experience. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes, so Meba, yes, please. And then as, as soon as Meba is done, uh, Benedict and team, we would love for you to speak as well. Yeah. Okay. Meba, please so, go ahead. With some of the equipments that we have here, when we were doing a test for pressure and oxygen, as the pressure is, uh, is uh, higher, the oxygen concentration seems to also go lower. So this is just to support the uh, comment that Kuna made with the volume change together with the con oxygen concentration change. So I've seen it with practice and also uh, with oxygen concentrators, we see the manuals and usually they say greater than 90%. Yeah, that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you, Meba, that was great. Thank you so much.
Musoma team, Benedict? Yeah, Benjamin and the team. Wow, this is so nice. It was so blessing today, actually. So uh, what I wanted to say is um, I love the content. I love everything of today. It was so nice. We took it. We took the lessons and everything, and we appreciate the uh, Ethiopian teams, Guna, uh, the assisted team. It was so nice today, I say I can say. Thank you, Benedict. That was very kind of you. Thank you so much for the help you guys provided as well with all the pictures. So, thank you from Takwara team. Thank you, Meba, as well. You guys did a phenomenal job putting content together. Um, I think we're coming towards the end of the session. Erin, do we have a poll that we're running? Yeah, we do. So I just launched it now. Um, I'll leave it open for five to 10 minutes so that we can all take some time and give some feedback. Um, as Benjamin said, this session in particular was derived entirely from the comments and questions. Um, we do take this stuff to heart and we really appreciate any feedback we can get. Um, it should only take a few minutes of your time. It's just about five questions. But if you go ahead and fill that out, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording as our session is just about over.